Morning, YouTube. Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I've got a great interview for you today. I'm speaking with Saurabh Amari. He is the founder and editor of Compact Magazine. To give you a quick preview of the conversation, I'll read you a quick line from Compact's mission statement on their website. Compact will challenge the overclass that controls government, culture, and capital. Now, I'm sure that plenty of people in the realignment listenership, left, right, and center, will find something that resonates there. So it'll be interesting to hear this conversation from that perspective. Like We're really interested as a show. We're focusing on people who are challenging the status quo from different perspectives. Sorab's a person who is on the right, but will also write a piece in favor of increased unionization and attacking his own side for policies that affected that in the past. So we're going to hit all those really great things there. Quick note before we get into the show. One, we launched our Supercast this week. So if you haven't gotten the chance, we'd love for you to go right down into the show notes on the YouTube description and subscribe and support the show. It's going to help us do the following. We are increasing the production of these episodes. So tomorrow on Friday, Sagar and I are going to have a discussion episode that's going to go back and forth, the more casual stuff that people on YouTube especially really enjoy. So that support really helps. It helps us expand the show, support our staff, all those great things. Let's get into the episode. So, Abramari, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to speak with you. We just wrapped a month-long series on Ukraine, various aspects of the conflict, and a huge listener complaint we got is that we uh, had a bit too much of a hawkish bent to the coverage. So I'm glad that you decided to not only have very specific non-hawkish views on Ukraine, but also put out a magazine that we're going to talk about towards, uh, you know, halfway through this episode to get that real perspective there. So with, with Compact, you had your, your first um, real post essay, and it was about hawkishness and the comparison to Iraq. Would love you just to open with your perspective and why you, you basically approach the conflict that way. Sure. I should, I should start out with a kind of personal um, or autobiographical dimension in this. I'm a, I'm a repentant hawk. Um, I started out my career in journalism at the Wall Street Journal editorial page, was there um, for five years. That was the peak of my hawkishness. I'm, I, I come from Iran. Obviously, I deplore the conditions back home. And so I had this conclusion, which happened to get a very warm reception, um, among my um, then colleagues that, you know, American power should be used to um, remake the world in our own image. And um, <clears throat> over time, I became disillusioned with that, like, like many others, you know, it, it, in my defense, I was in my mid 20s, when I started on my kind of uh, neoconservative career. Many others who actually carried out these policies um, should have been wiser by age, you know, 50 or what have you. Um, so that's the backdrop to this. But yeah, I mean, we had we went through this disillusionment. And I think I came to conclude that it was necessary to be disillusioned, that you couldn't look at how the 20 years or the two decades since 9-11, how they played out without changing your mind about this kind of always forward foot, always kind of expansionist account of American foreign policy, especially in its more idealistic dimensions, which tends to divide the world into just like two big camps of two uh, agglomerations of good and evil, Autobots and Decepticons, and we're the good guys, and th there are a certain number of bad guys who have to be um, not only militarily punished, but made to become part of Team Autobot. Um, so I was honestly very pleased at, to make a story, uh, a long story short, I was very pleased with President Biden and his pullout of Afghanistan. I knew the images wouldn't look good, but I was one of those people who thought it was never going to look pretty to leave Afghanistan. So um, at some point we had to do it. And I was glad that he pulled the bandaid. And I predicted, and I think this has been borne out by polls that, you know, they, the, the images wouldn't last as a as a kind of public uh, opinion issue for long. They, their effects wouldn't last for very long. Um, and so uh, then I was dismayed, dismayed, but that six months later, we're back to, almost back to the Bush second inaugural. You remember the 2005 Bush second inaugural was that kind of hawkish interventionist view at its most, stated at its most extreme, President Bush declared a war on, quote, tyranny the whole world over. What did that mean? How would we deal with all sorts of allies that we have that don't exactly 
get high rankings from Freedom House and other kind of organizations like that. It was insane. And in fact, that's not even what Bush policy was in practice in many ways. It was more nuanced than that. So to see then, you know, all the same personnel almost framing the war on Ukraine as a matter of, as this kind of Manichaean theory of good versus evil. And then to see President Biden talk about regime change, walk it back, uh, at least have the administration walk it back, but nevertheless then tweet out that same weekend when he talked about regime changing Moscow. Um, he did tweet out, we are in a long war between autocracy and uh, democracy, quote, between liberty and repression. It was just like deja vu. And how did this, how did we come back to this point? What, what is it about the kind of American uniparty structure of Democrats and Republicans that can't let go of this way of thinking? So I wrote this piece for Compact, um, the new magazine we launched on March 22nd, in which I said, why is it that we're back to where we are? And one conclusion I drew is that we're back where we are because it's all the same personnel. And I specifically focus on the figure of Victoria Newland, who's now the Under Secretary of State and the administration's point man on Ukraine, point woman on Ukraine, I should say. And she, um, her career is very interesting because she started out under Strobe Talbot in the Clinton administration, then was an aide to Dick Cheney in the first Bush administration, was ambassador to NATO in the second Bush administration, was assistant secretary of state and state department spokeswoman under Obama. Interestingly, not part of the, the Trump administration and now is back. Um, and so just the fact that figures like her flit in and out of administration, regardless of which party is in power and kind of push the same worldview is one explanation for why I think where we are, where I think we're making a mistake by um, continuing to escalate this, to talk about it in these Manichaean terms and really the scary stuff, which is talking about regime change in Moscow, which, you know, you're not talking about some podunk Arab democracy, Arab cryptocracy anymore. You're talking about a nuclear power with the largest kind of strategic arsenal in the world. It's insane to my mind to still um, have fan even entertain fantasies of regime change. So that's the gist of the piece at compactmag.com. Um, but we've also hosted many other writers from left and right, and we can get into compact because it's a kind of, it's a magazine that tries to bring about a shared critique of, of left and right together of this, of this elite, of this ruling class. Um, so we've run, obviously, Peter Hitchens uh, on how NATO lost its way. Uh, we've run um, Ashley Frawley, uh, who's a, a Marxist writer, uh, about how it's a mistake to kind of make of, of Putin a cartoon villain. Um, my co-founder, Matthew Schmitz, wrote a piece about why social conservatives like him are parting ways with um, neoconservatives, despite their alliance under the old conservative fusionism. So we're, uh, we're going out there, you know, very kind of, I'd say boldly staking out this um, position in favor of foreign policy restraint. Yeah. And I've got a couple of follow-ups here. So one, the first thing I was thinking of when you were describing your intellectual journey over the past 20 years is you remind me of an old neocon in terms of the way the term was initially described, especially in the 70s. So these were, and this is for the listeners, obviously, if you're especially under 30, you think of the term neoconservative, you're going to think of the Iraq war, foreign policy, interventionism, et cetera. But actually the term in terms of the first generation originates in the 1970s. And the way it was described among, by many was they were liberals who were mugged by reality. It feels as if you were a neoconservative who was mugged by reality. And now you're now holding a different position. So I just said at a biographical level, I'd like you to address what that has felt like, because it seems that much of what I think our audiences share is this feeling of events have happened and it's unmoored people from labels, titles, conceptions. How are you personally thinking of that aspect? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, one by, by one biographical element in this, or what it's felt like, is I've I get uh, criticism often by people who say that you know you've changed your mind drastically, as though that's a crime. Um, first of all, that you in the light of in light of events, um, if you don't change your mind, there's something um, 
broken and rigid about you or fragile about you. So I, I don't consider it a crime to change one's mind. But more fundamentally, I would say that there is a kind of inner integrity in my intellectual development. At least it sort of feels like subjectively from the inside, even if uh, some of my critics don't notice it. And what I mean by that is, you know, my I'm an immigrant. Uh, I came from Iran when I was 13 years old. And um, I love this country very, very much. There is no other, like there is no other place I can be someone like me. Right. Uh, there's no going back to Iran for me. You know, there's that character in Welbeck's novel uh, Submission where <laughs> Islamists have taken over France and his his um, his girlfriend is Jewish. And so she's like, well, I'm making Aliyah. I'm I'm immigrating to Israel. And our protagonist of the novel says, oh, there's no Israel for me. Um, what, what that means is I, like I, I'm in the same boat. Like I want this country to do well. And in the quick follow up on that, I mean, yeah. the obvious response, I'm not asking this in bad faith is, can't Hungary be um, in Israel for you? No, because, because, you know, I wish, I mean, that, that opens up a whole other set of questions, which is, you know, there are these experiments in um, national conservatism or, or populist conservatism underway in Hungary, in Poland, and also in, elsewhere across the developed world, really, um, you could argue Brexit was another manifestation of it in Britain. Um, but I am fully Americanized. I mean, I mm -hmm. uh, first of all, Hungarian is a very difficult language. It, it, the CIA considers it one of the most difficult languages to learn. I think it's just like harder than Mandarin. Um, uh, and and the second one is that you know I I, I have become the, the American project and the American nation and its profound assimilative power has become part of me and I've become part of it. And so, no, I, I, so I would say no, but just to carry on the thought, um, I wish it to do well. And in the aftermath of 9-11, um, it was very easy to say that what, what threatens this country is mainly external forces, radical jihadism, et cetera. And those are real threats, by the way. I mean, we should, I'm not naive about them. But over time, uh, I've come to conclude that um, the central problem is internal to the United States. And so if I want the United States to do well, we have to repair the, the domestic hearth, if you will. We have to, domestic, we have to repair our um, you know, decaying infrastructure. I would argue uh, the vast material inequalities be between rich and poor in this country, which kind of make a mockery of its democratic, small d democratic promise, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Our, our, and I would say, I would argue our cultural polarization and, and rot in some ways. So those are the issues that really, I think, threaten us. And that's why I've shifted my, my focus in response to these developments in my own intellectual development. So, um, so that's, that's what it feels like internally, that you get criticized for having changed your mind. I'm like, yes, I guess in response to events, but the main thrust is, is I think, ultimately a kind of patriotism, a desire for this, this nation, for, the, for its people to do well, to fulfill our kind of founding promise. And so, um, yeah. Uh, the, the other thing is, I mean, just briefly, I mean, obviously you make some ex-friends. You make some ex-friends, right? So there are people who um, uh, considered you allies, you know, I, my first job I got from um, Brett Stevens at the Wall Street Journal. I worked for him for, for five years. And so, um, so we've come to disagree because, you know, he's still, uh, you know, to his credit in some ways, he's, he still um, thinks the main role uh, the, the United States should be kind of world police and um, uh, that the kind of conservatism I now espouse, espouse is really anathema. And so, you know, um, uh, we, we, we're not, we don't uh, commune politically anymore. And there are others of the kind, uh, but I still respect them. I still, I still read Brett. I think he's a very smart guy, but uh, that's the other kind of what it feels like from the inside is, is uh, rupturing or straining some friendships. Yeah. And uh, I want to spend a little more time on the foreign policy part here. Cause I think it, I think it gets at the tensions that are interesting. I read the piece on the Hawks and I think the part of the critique I really agree with is this idea 
um, you made reference to it's basically impossible to fail under this system. So essentially, no matter what happens, you have the same players moving on. And I think I think there's something to that saying that as a think tank fellow, obviously, I need to be self aware about those dynamics. But I, I noticed three specific things happened on the interventionist side that I think really delegitimized that perspective. I don't think you engaged in them, but I'm just curious what your response. So this is this is my response to your article. So one, um, too many anti-interventionists put all their eggs in the basket of Putin's all talk. He won't actually invade. Um, so they were they they decided to make predictions, especially relating to the intelligence community, that regardless of the claims you're making, were not necessary to make. You could say, "Hey, Putin's going to invade, but we still don't need to intervene." Um, two, um, anti-interventionist. I think. Not no, not all anti, but some people, but for culture war reasons at home, started essentially simping for Putin because it triggered libs. Um, I think Tucker did this a lot um, in terms of you know that part, and then the third part here would be that I think a lot of anti-interventionists underestimated the ways upon which the Ukrainian national story right now would resonate with America and its understanding of itself. So hey, there's a big power invading a smaller power. Hey, wow, the plucky small power is surviving. There's something that rhymes with Israel here too. So I, I'd just like you to respond to those three dynamics that I think inter anti-interventionists need to reckon with those ideas moving forward. Sure. Um, so the first one, the issue of Putin won't invade, I blessedly uh, didn't make any kind of prediction personally. I'm not in the prognostication business, a kind of prediction business. My, my main business is to say what ought to be rather than what mm -hmm. will be. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I do know that others made that. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, I think you're right that that's a mistake, but I, 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 I did not engage in that. What I did say was that as, as it seemed like uh, things were becoming critical, I praised Biden, um, especially in his much derided by the kind of uniparty hawks um, press conference in which he used the phrase minor incursion. Um, I think he made some good points there. Minor incursion was a cringe inducing phrase, obviously. But the idea that he said that, uh, well, the US response should be reciprocal or proportional to what Russia actually ends up doing, that Russia does have some legitimate claims. He, he more or less said that in that uh, news conference. He didn't put it in those words, but they said, oh, well, we know they have concerns about NATO expansion or, or about NATO, um, NATOizing Ukraine. Um, and so that's, that's what I said. That's what I have on the record. So I don't want to really speak for others other than to say that there were a class of very serious foreign policy realists who absolutely warned that something like this could happen. And they warned not two months ago, not three months ago, but like back in 2014, um, when the US backed this kind of velvet revolution and, and uh, Newland, when we spoke about, went down to Maidan, the Maidan Square in Kiev and handed out like cookies or whatever to, to, the, to the protesters. And, and um, you know, Mir Sharma warned that the, the stance we're taking there is likely to antagonize Russia because no, set aside Putin, no Russian government can really stand NATO coming so close to its doorstep. And so um, those were the people who said it, this will happen. And um, those are the ones I think we should, among anti-interventionists or realists, we should take, take seriously. The second one, the same thing of Putin, um, again, uh, I've never done that. And, and there was one article in the Deseret News in which I was described as, quote, pro-Putin, and I forced them to run a correction because throughout my time speaking about things back when I was a hawk and now, I've always said, like, look, he, you know, there's no love lost. There's no reason to um, praise the man or anything. You just take him realistically for what he is. He's a, he's a kind of um, typical Russian leader if you have a a grasp, especially of the of the 19th century, he, he's very familiar in some ways. Um, so, you know, I won't speak for others other than to say, like, I have to defend my friend Tucker here a little bit. I think that the monologue for which he got a lot of heat was when, where he said, you know, has Putin threatened to take away my job because of something I said at work, et cetera, et cetera. That was not saying Putin is good. Well, all, all that amounted to is saying kind of something I said earlier on this show, which is, Right now, for the American people, 
especially for ordinary Americans, our own domestic elite is much more likely to be at odds with us than, than um, you know, a, 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 an authoritarian Russian leader thousands of miles away. That's not the same as saying, therefore, Putin good. So I have to, I have to kind of push back on, on whether or not Tucker really simp for Putin. The last one was... Um, Oh, reckoning the, with the reckoning with the way that the story would resonate. The American people, um, you know, to speak very frankly, the rallying of of populations in let's say kind of great among great powers and and imperial powers, the rallying of populations over the fate of small nations is a very old phenomenon indeed. Right. So, for example, the fate of the fate of Greek. Uh, uh, Greek people and, and of, of Greece under Ottoman rule was constantly a source of um, uh, kind of agitation among among Western powers um, throughout the 19th century or the, or, or the fate of Serbs and others. Uh, again, I'm talking centuries ago. And so it's a very familiar phenomenon. And if you're if you're worried about the United States going down an imperial past, then you have to reckon very kind of realistically with that and say that um, it is very easy for ordinary Americans, especially with kind of surround sound, very kind of unanimous um, uh, uh, news coverage and, 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 and opinion coverage, not just on MSNBC or what have you, but on Fox News as well. Tucker accepted. When you have that kind of thing, of course, a, a, a the domestic audiences here will be like, yes, you know, suddenly like this level of profound identification with Ukraine, which if you put into perspective with all the other conflicts going on in the world, some of which the U.S. happens to be on the side of the larger power um, against the smaller power, what have you, becomes a little bit less um, sort of morally righteous. Um, so I would I would say those things about those three things that, you, you know, and I, I, the last thing is, I, I do think there is a kind of shift. I was talking to someone who you know, follows these things very closely and monitors search terms. And maybe the first two weeks, you saw a lot of searches for Ukraine war. Um, but now it's shifting to Ukraine inflation, you know, Ukraine gas prices and so forth. So um, people's um, sentiments easily easily shift and they sway this way and that in response to what the power centers broadcast to them and then also what their own everyday reality might be as as events develop i'm really interested in your use of the term empire and imperial when it comes to the united states because obviously you can look at the us's force posture overseas bases territories there's a left and a right wing version of this and say that the us operationally um, is an empire separate from just the pure, that word is pejorative part, but I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm interested in you describing the policy in Ukraine as imperial in the sense that my reaction is, well, it seems that Russia is being imperial here and whether or not the U.S. backs the Ukrainians with arms or not. That doesn't constitute empire to me. So I'm just curious how you, how you, because by that state, were we imperial when we sent the candy bombers to um, help the people of Berlin in 19, in the 1940s. So I'm just trying to understand your use of the word imperial yeah. when we're not really moving forward. We're just maintaining a status quo. So um, several things there. It's absolutely the case that Russia is also acting like an empire, right? They're a, they're a, they're a great power. And a great power with sort of wounded pride and a sense of a of a, a, a being uh, outflanked on every front um, after the Cold War. Um, so when I use the term empire, um, it doesn't necessarily always have that pejorative connotation. It's just that there are historic empires, and the U.S. happens to be. Uh, one of them, and the U.S. has has trouble expect a, a, accepting other great powers, um, kind of civilizational spheres or spheres of influence, in part because it conceives of its own sphere of influence as almost spanning the whole globe, such that when you have these revanchist powers reasserting themselves in their own immediate neighborhood, um, we see it as a threat to to us because we we sort of think of the whole world as as um, as as 
the domain of let's say US led um, kind of rules based international order. Now, um, I, I cite back to, to, to a lot of international realist kind of thinkers, Mearsheimer, um, uh, Chalmers Johnson, there's a wonderful column at Compact today by our columnist Malcolm Cune, who said basically that, yeah, that's, you know, there, there are good things about that system, the rule US led international um, order. But let's be honest, there is an imperial dimension to this, right? The, the United States has certain interests um, in Europe, in East Asia, and so forth. Um, and those interests, if, if expressed too ideologically and too expansively, will bring us into conflict with other, other historic empires. And so um, I wouldn't say there's a kind of pejorative or positive connotation to my use of it. I would say it's just a, a more kind of historical materialist account of what the US um, is, right, and has, has done. Um, are there instances in which our um, assertion of a, of a wide imperial sphere have been um, positively beneficial and good, like the I like the Berlin airlift? Sure, yeah, I absolutely support it. But we should we should be a honest about the fact that we ha we do have a kind of uh, uh, imperial posture in the world, and this is very hard to deny. Um, you know, no other power is so actively involved across the globe um, to the extent that we are. And B, to then be, if we're honest about it, then we can say, okay, you know, that, that's that's absolutely in our national interest and it's a just cause and we can support it. There are other cases where you look at it, you're like, mm, I'm not sure if that's in our national interest. And I don't know if we're, if if all the moral equities on our, are, are on our side, so we should be a little bit more restrained. So if you take out the pejorative element out of it, then you can be kind of level-headed and, and, um, and, and look at things in a, a kind of realistic way. Yeah, and speaking of revanchist powers, looking at the world beyond just Ukraine, a lot of the debates that really matter, especially I think that you were responding to with, with the initial article, were the debates about no-fly zones, the debates about MiG-29s going there. It seems as if we have settled into some type of equilibrium, where I would say the debate around hawkishness is going to matter moving forward beyond just Ukraine, no matter how the conflict turns out, is in the China context. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how you think of the U.S. relationship towards China, how you think of Taiwan, how broadly speaking the thoughts you're articulating here, no predictions, obviously, how this all applies to China moving forward. Or how they should apply. Um, well, we can't, we can't separate Russia and, and Russia, Ukraine, and China now because we've, um, in a way, um, by going, I would argue, um, by being so resistant to, to um, the possibility of dialogue with Russia, and especially our use of these sanctions, we've we've um, assured this um, bandwagoning, let's say, between the great Eurasian powers, between uh, between Russia and China, and between India India in the picture as well, right? That um, um, that they they look at how the U.S. responded, and they're asking questions of whether or not they should set up kind of ruble uh, mechanisms for buying Russian energy because they're, they take their own energy needs seriously. Uh, they're talking about whether they, they can continue to maintain the dollar as a reserve currency if their access to their uh, <laughs> national wealth can be frozen at the, at the click of a button by, by the US president, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, the, the response to, to Russia, which again, I've made my views clear, on that have caused this kind of counter hegemonic block to form. Now, what's what's sad about that, what, and why I think it's a mistake um, long term for U.S. national security, is that there's no reason for these these, especially these three, to bandwagon together. Right? A decade ago, um, when when I was at the Wall Street Journal with Brett, we had a, a a retired Russian general come to the Wall Street Journal. And he had written a book in Russian, but he wanted to tell us about it. And as it was about his alarm about um, China's nuclear um, expansionism, right? The fact that China was building these kind of uh, very sophisticated warheads and whether or not the Russian arsenal was sufficient to counter that um, on, their, on their Eastern flank. So 
there's no reason for China and Russia to always have a, a, an exactly comfortable relationship. With, with uh, India, the, the um, rivalry is even more kind of obvious and intense, right? They, they, have, they have territorial disputes with each other. Uh, um, at the, the China supports Pakistan in part as a kind of um, thorn, in, thorn in the side of India. So there's no reason, but, but by, by the response that the West has taken, which is the international community the good and the just are all on one side. And if you're not absolutely with us, then you're kind of against us. You're an autocracy, you're a bad guy, you're a Decepticon in the great Manichaean battle of good and evil, forces powers who may be more ambiguous to be like, oh, okay, well, then we're going with that because we have worries about our currency, our energy reserve, our, our access to energy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thought that the fact that we've made the, the Russia, China, India issues kind of, we've glued them together where maybe they didn't have to be glued together. The second point about China itself, the position I've taken, I wrote a, a, an op-ed in the New York Times with um, some of my fellow thinkers on foreign policy and other issues as well, Gladden Papin and Patrick Deneen, in which we said we should defend treaty allies, but not extend, um, uh, which the implication of which, right, is that there are parts of the East Asian theater where we shouldn't extend our um, our kind of defensive umbrella without coming into um, serious conflicts, which may not be uh, militarily prepared to deal with right now. Um, and so I think for me, I, I, won't, I don't want to speak for my co-authors, but I think for me that includes um, uh, Taiwan, right? Because that, Taiwan, we, we have the we have a congressional statute urging us to generally support Taiwan, but we don't have a the same kind of mutual defense treaty that we have um, with say Japan or uh, other other East Asian powers. So what that means to me is um, not to not to become too confrontational over that issue. There are people talking about like mining the South China Sea and so forth. I think that's crazy. I mean, um, and, and how many theaters can the, U can the US simultaneously combat great powers? You know, we're, uh, in a proxy war, essentially, with Russia and Ukraine. Um, we still are involved in various ways in the Middle East, and we want to now start a, a front with China. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't take China seriously as a, as a global threat. Um, you know, we've called for punishing intellectual property theft. We've called for, um, uh, you know, again, def defending and our treaty allies and making it clear that we would deter any aggression against treaty allies. That's very important. Um, and um, generally speaking, I think we should try to decouple industrially and build up industrial capacity and supply chains here so that we're not so dependent in China as we saw we were, in fact, in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. So all of this means we should just be, what I'm outlining, I know it sounds complex, but it's a kind of a kind of realism. I mean, I can't, I can't describe it any other way is to not be so ideological in our response to, in our response to the rest of the world. Um, but that doesn't mean be naive either, because obviously, you know, China is a serious rival in many ways, and we should we should be very careful. I just think that um, the hawks right now want confrontation with Russia and China in such a way that will prevent us from actually being able to do what we need to do to come out on top as an industrial power. If our, if, if for another generation we're going to have powers this we're going to have wars and this time wars with great power we're not going to be able to do the kind of industrial capacity building stem development um uh, 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 you know sort of building up the home front that we would need it, it, god forbid in case there's a serious confrontation we you know we'll just kind of have have these proxy wars etc which could escalate with nuclear powers and the, the internal problems that have made the United States weak relative to these powers won't have been addressed. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but it's such a big question. I hope that's okay. No, I mean, that's the <laughs> that's the purpose of the hour-long format. Like, seriously, go as long as you need to go. So one last foreign policy question before we get to the Compact Magazine, because I've got actually some like specific and meta questions there. So the question I'd have basically is another frustration I've had with the anti-interventionist side. And once again, I think because of your foreign policy background, this isn't an issue with you as much, is I very much know what many anti, and what's also, I'm not asking you to speak for anyone. I'm just issuing what the critique is. I know what basically every single anti-interventionist does not want when it comes to US foreign policy. Um, what I don't know as much is what they want 
in a positive sense. Uh, because the example I always go back to, and you know, I'm sure you know this history, if you go back and you read the um, foreign affairs article that Condoleezza Rice wrote for George W. Bush in 2000 before he's actually elected president, if you, if you took out Condoleezza Rice, if you took out George W. Bush and you showed this to, let's say, like a 20-something person who says, I'm anti-interventionist, they say, this is great. Bill Clinton was too interventionist in the 1990s. The U.S. should be more focused. There was too much focus on humanitarian issues. All that was stated. Everyone, I think, especially in your audience, would be happy with that. The second the 9-11 happened, all that goes out the table, um, regardless of whether or not the positions that Bush administration took were correct. That all went out the table because the vision that was actually put there wasn't actually sustainable given the actual challenges. So that's why I think it's deeply important that when you say those types of things, you actually say, here is what we want in the face of challenges. So how would you try to sum up how your side should say what we want or how should we think about it? Like, what would the vision, what would the story be? The story would be cultural non-aggression abroad and material development at home. So what I mean by that is, and, and I would say defensive treaty allies. Those are the three. Um, the first one, defensive treaty allies. Um, well, I mentioned it last, but let's just get, get it out of the way. I think that the United States, when it makes treaty commitments to other countries, it should uphold by them. So I think, you know, the Biden administration is absolutely right that we're not going to give up a single inch of NATO territory. Do I think successive rounds of NATO expansion maybe may have been a mistake? That's, that's a kind of, that's an ac academic question now. The fact is that we made the treaty commitment and um, having already sort of betrayed too many allies in um, uh, treaty allies in, uh, in, in the course of our history, uh, we should not do any further. We should not go any further in terms of throwing our, our treaty allies under the bus. Um, now, in order to be able to, I think, treat, defend them properly, and to be able to face up to the challenges of the 21st century, I think we need material development at home. So um, the, the um, old slogan, and it's a, it's a, it's a slogan that um, goes back to James Warburg, who was FDR's um, uh, personal financier and a kind of thinker in the FDR brain trust, certainly not an isolationist, was foreign policy begins at home. What he mean, meant by that, this was, it was a book written um, in, in the 1940s. What he meant by that is that the United States is, at the time he saw it, was profoundly unequal internally. And um, you had labor unrest, you had the sense that workers' lives were precarious. And he was saying that that may become a problem for us in the confrontations of the 20th century. And in a way, that response uh, led to the a social peace that lasted, let's say, from 1940 to 1970. Now I'm getting to the social history of the United States, where unions got a much, much more serious um, seat at the table. Industrial unionization grew in that period. And there was this kind of government, capital, labor, tri tripartite um, kind of conversation or discussion, where my friend Michael Lynn describes it, that, that uh, it produced enormous kind of economic uh, stability and prosperity and so forth. So um, we need something that, like that right now. Because what we have is a society that's, um, our, our material inequalities are too, too wide. Um, our infrastructure is, no matter what kind of national review types will tell you, our infrastructure is fine. I live in New York City. Our infrastructure really feels 19th century at points. You go to like African countries, Asian countries, European countries, and they're so far ahead of us in some of these cases. So. That sort of thing, we got to be able to do that. Supply chains, scientific re research and development, we're falling behind. Missile defense, falling behind. All of that. I, that's what I mean by material development. And then cultural non aggression, it just means, you know, stop lecturing the world and stop. The world is just, I, I believe me, I, I used to mouth the slogans. I used to mouth the slogans. The world is just too complex to divide the whole world between autocracies and democracies. Uh, bad guys and good guys, because and, and 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 in some ways exporting our own social pathologies, which are causing immense polarization at home, um, uh, and forcing it down the throats of countries that don't necessarily want them, but they want friendship with the United States. And so, you know, we should we should seek to have the friendship without trying to lecture the world. Again, too long of an answer, but that's how I describe it. Defensive treaty allies, foreign policy begins at home slash material development, 
and cultural non-aggression, ideological non-aggression. No, once again, good answer, because it gets at the critique I was issuing of the Bush era conservatives, because if, 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 if you just know what you don't want, but don't have a forward, for example, given what you just described, let's say it's 2001 and 9-11 happens, you could have input, okay, this attack happened, this issue happened, how long do we stay in Afghanistan? Do we invade Iraq? That actually would provide a way of thinking through these issues, whether or not the individual takes or perspectives were correct. And I think that's something that more integrated. I think more folks need to need to do that. So thank you. Okay, so now we are to the very specific part on Compact Magazine. I really about sections are rarely that interesting, but I really liked the magazine. You have a really interesting definition of radicalism. Um, and I, and I'd like you to, to, to really explain if, if you know it off the top of your head, um, I could also reference it, but I love you just to like articulate like what, what, what the, the pushing away from this being from radicalism being about extremes of left or right, rather it's something different for you. Absolutely. So, um, compact magazine was something I co-founded with two co-equal partners, um, Matthew Schmitz of first things magazine who comes from the world of uh, let's say traditionalist conservatism or social conservatism. I myself, I've described my own kind of intellectual trajectory. And then we have Edwin Aponte, who's, who's described as a, describes himself as a labor populist or a labor Marxist. Um, and we also have a senior editor, Nina Power, who is a British um, feminist. And um, so why would this kind of eclectic bunch come together? It's not in order that we might find, find like in a, cheesy bipartisan way, like we're just coming together to find common ground, man. No, it's the fact that we think um, that there is a, there's definitely a ruling class in the United States and the West that um, you know, controls not just government, but also culture, but most importantly, capital. And that it's for too long, you know, done very well for itself at the expense of working class people, middle class people. And, um, so, and, but it has a kind of hegemony that needs to be challenged. And that's what we're out to do from, from the perspective that Matthew and I bring, but also from the perspective of kind of materialist leftism that Edwin and Nina bring to the table and a lot of our contributors as well. And so we, we're going to subject that overclass to um, this, this shared critique, if you will. Uh, and we say that that's going to get us called radical um, and we don't we don't shy away from the label because radical means going to the root of a problem, right? Radix uh, it, it, it sort of a, etymologically means going to the root of a, a, a problem, and that's what we're aiming to do. We would argue further that in some ways it's our ruling class, it's that bipartisan ruling class which we just talked about, for example, in the person of someone like Victoria Newland, who's actually extreme relative to what ordinary American people want uh, from foreign policy or, uh, you know, Silicon Valley types, the cultural policies they, they push in tandem with a very kind of repressive censorship mechanism, plus their own, you know, uh, 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 it, it, monopolistic kind of power over the economy. You put all of that together, from the point of view of a lot of Americans, it's, it's that worldview that is extreme. And to challenge it is not at all extreme, yet Today, if you if you um, say that you are against this kind of elite consensus or ruling class consensus, you're going to be called radical. Again, we 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 apply the label to ourselves proudly, but rightly understood. Whoops, uh, <laughs> that will be edited out hopefully. Um, so the question that I'd ask then is, I want to I want to get to what the what you see as the purpose mm. of a magazine. Cause there were, there were a lot of critiques when you launched, but the critique that actually just pissed me off is someone who comes from the space that you're in, but also has interest in the future of media is mm. some folks are like, why did they get a New York times profile? Mm. They don't have that many subscribers yet. There aren't that many daily active users or viewers. And, and to me, that critique fundamentally misunderstood the the purpose of what a, what, a, what a magazine should be. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say success for you means you get 200 million readers um, mm -hmm. every single day necessarily. So how, how, would, how would you answer the question of like, what is success given what you're trying to do? Um, sure, I mean, we don't want uh, 200 million readers. We're not, we're not like BuzzFeed or 
or BuzzFeed at its height, let's say. I mean, BuzzFeed is not what it used to be either, but um, that's not what we are. We're an intellectual magazine. Middle highbrow is our tone, is how we, do, we describe it. But we do have a metric for success. I mean, we want to, we do want to reach, um, you know, again, the ordinary curious reader in the United States and Europe. Um, and so um, I should say we are growing. We have more than a thousand paid subscribers now. Three weeks in, it's pretty. We're pretty happy about that. We're for profit, which means that we're not um, we're not beholden to donors types, like whether left wing or right wing donors. That's something Matthew Matthew and I were especially keen to escape. Coming from the conservative world, as you know, there's always like a, a donor type will then say, "I want you to run this article," uh, and we have just no pressure like that. Um, but you know, you're right. I mean, our it ultimately success for us means um, publishing. We, we publish one piece a daily a day for now, but at least one of those pieces per week becomes the marquee piece that people talk about, that people can't dis help but discuss on podcasts. And that that's how you influence the realm of ideas. And we still think that matters. We take inspiration from the old generation neocons that you mentioned um, earlier in this show. Uh, you know, I used to work at Commentary. Um, the public interest, these magazines um, were never as huge as, I don't know, the- uh, uh, Life or time or back when those time, things were but things. But nevertheless, they they shifted the dial and shifted the dial in very positive ways, I would argue. Like you said, in the 1960s and 70s, they they brought a new realism to the, to the American scene. So um, we still think that small magazines can do that. Now, we don't have a print publication yet, we're online only, but- um, you know, we, we have had the kind of marquee pieces so far that we're, we're very proud of. We had a piece by Alex Gutentag, who's a left writer based in San Francisco, former school teacher, called The Great Reset is Real, which sounds like, uh, you know, kind of trolly, but it, it actually kind of lays out that a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of Davos type elites are, did, were trying to use the pandemic to alter how we use money and kind of create a, a, a social credit system uh, in all but name. Uh, so that became that kind of marquee piece that we aim for. Um, Peter Hitchens had this wonderful critique of what is NATO for uh, or how, how, how NATO lost its way um, and again became a conversation piece. More recently, I, I think you mentioned it, but we had this, um, it's more of a signing statement uh, headlined away from the abyss where we called for de-escalation de over the Ukraine. And it was gratifying because you had people like you know, Michael Anton, who's a former Trump guy and um, former uh, national security staffer in the Trump administration at Claremont, very man, very much a man of the of the, of the right. Um, or uh, Josh Hammer, who's a more of a nationalist, Emil Doak and, and uh, Helen Andrews, who are of the American conservative, more of the paleocon uh, types. But then we also had, um, you know, Freddie DeBoer and Vivek Chibber and um, Ashley Frawley and Glenn Greenwald and people who are of the left coming together to uh, Samuel Moyne coming together to to say that um, you know we're the, the march to sort of insane escalation is insane and um, that definitely ruffled some feathers you know not everyone agreed with us lots of people did but plenty didn't and it's it's getting written up and um, so we we did our job as far as we're concerned it's getting it's getting discussed for good and ill yeah and uh, for the three last big questions that really matter. I want to ask you about how much your project is interested in these categories of left and right. Um, you did a great interview with Ross Douthat on the Ezra Klein podcast that I think people should reference. And you specifically said, like, I wouldn't exactly always categorize myself as conservative. Like, and when you look at someone like Gren Greenwald, um, so like, I'm not going to say he's a conservative, but I would say that given how weird things are, especially how these are about, because like you said, like, I like your definition of overclass because for me, the central domestic political question is like, are you aligned against, let's say, the center left or are you not? Um, the center left being Twitter staff, um, people in the Biden administration, New York Times publishing side, all those different bits. And does Glenn Greenwald probably have a position on universal health care that isn't the same as a conservative one? No, but he is a part of a coalition that certainly... Um, is against the people who control what you would call the American left. So how do you just think of these labels? Because they get so contentious, but I think there's something to that idea that it's not quite accurate to call Glenn Greenwald 
um, a man of the left in the way that these debates are actually unfolding? Well, I mean, the Washington Post recently described him as right wing journalist. And uh, I mean, that, that just suggests that anything that, that the, over, the overclass doesn't like now codes as right wing. And that's very troubling and incorrect because, as you know, I mean, Glenn is an opponent of uh, Bolsonaro's government, government in, in Brazil, real, a real thorn in the side and friendly with Lula, the former center left gov- um, uh, uh, president of, of Brazil, uh, you know. He's certainly no social conservative. Uh, so to try to try to peg anyone who strays from the line as as right wing is is silly. But you're right that some of these categories are are collapsing. I would say that for Compact, we are definitely uh, out to challenge both the right wing, quote unquote, and the left wing of the overclass. So we definitely have a critique of a kind of leftism that has lots to say about uh, gender and sexuality and the latest kind of ever shifting uh, kind of uh, 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 orthodoxies that are required for you to be a, um, that, that you're required to adhere to in order to be a, a, a progressive in good standing, but has very little to say about class. And in fact, um, its ideology can very easily tra- cash out as an as a human resources ideology rather than a properly um, pro working class um, uh, ideology. That said, we also think there's a problem on the right, right? And Matthew and I are especially familiar with it coming from the, 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 the world of the right. And what that is, is a right that claims to value family and community and church attendance and blah, 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 but supports a, an economics that undermines all of those things. So you have conservatives who are like, oh, man, church attendance rates are, are collapsing. Oh, you know, people aren't, uh, people aren't getting married, people are having children, but they also support... Um, you know, labor arbitrage in every way you can imagine, tax and regulatory arbitrage, every way you can imagine, corporate outsourcing, the destruction of, of, of the American labor union. Um, they, they're, they're, they're also, I think, both of those camps in one way or another undermine the very goods that they claim to cherish. And so what, we're, what we want to do is kind of keep both of them equally accountable. And I'll merge these two questions together. Something that's very interesting from our audience is a lot of audience members feel that a lot of the problems you're describing are either a generational. So like the issue in American politics is that Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, and Trump, different ends of the spectrum there obviously are too old and that so much of this will be solved by younger leaders or B, and this is more of a left critique mm-hmm. um, and even a center left critique, which is that the actual structure of America, whether it's um constitutional amendments or the nature of the Senate are the actual impediments to change. Like what, what is, what's your perspective on this? I think the quick editorial I'll insert here is I think to everyone who thinks our issues are generational, I don't think electing Madison Cawthorn made us able to solve basically anything that we're listing here today. So it's a little more complicated than the old people are the problem, but let's just close with this basic topic area. I mean, I, I'm pretty skeptical of, uh, of generational critiques. Um, I think class-based critiques are a lot more salient. Such, and if you are, um, if you have a class-based critique, then you can see why the boomers, for example, who started out as this revolutionary generation out to topple existing power structures, came very easily to actually occupy the commanding heights of of the post-war economy, and then they became the C-suite, C-suite executives, the university administrators, the, the lawyers, the columnists, et cetera. Um, and so that transformation is, is very interesting to me. And um, it's not explained by just an easy generational um, critique because then you see, for example, um, the next generation, millennials and zillennials, I suspect without a change in, ha- in our class structure will come to inherit the same structures of rule or misrule um so no i'm i yeah i i'm not i'm not hugely fond of of that um i do think i do think i i buy some of the left critiques of our institutions especially i mean 
coming from the conservative world, so many conservatives think of their role in coming to power as not using power. I am in government to prevent government from doing stuff. And what that means is in practice, in effect, it means upholding various private tyrannies, right? Uh, the tyranny of the employer over the employee, the tyranny of the, of the monopolistic firm over the consumer, the tyranny of, um, of the uh, private equity fund over the public pension plan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the, the, the claim that institutions are there so that, so that they don't do stuff in practice cashes out as um, the institutions work to the benefit of, of, of people who uh, do well right now in our current economy and not so well for people who are disadvantaged economically. So I, ironically, I'm, I'm more, I'm more, um, I'm more sympathetic to that institutional critique, the one that you mentioned, the second one, the latter, and less so to the, uh, less sympathetic to the former generational one. I think, I don't know how much generations tell us. Excellent. So Rob, this has been really great. Would love for you just to shout out the, the magazine one last time for folks um, who are interested. Uh, it's, this was a great conversation, Marshall. Thank you for having me. The magazine is called Compact. And you can find it at www.compactmag.com. Good show. Thanks for coming on The Realignment. Thank you.